Okay. So you made me a co-host. I did, just in case I have the other, the ZBA meeting on, um, on another computer, just kind of hanging out here in case I need to go over there. Okay. Before you sign off, do you have a minute to, uh, oh, yeah, no, they're not, they're not there yet. So they, we have a little bit of time. Um, hey everybody, let me just, I just want to make sure I can see everything. I'd like to see attendees by, oh yeah. Okay. We're here. We're here. All right. Oh, Sid just joined us. All right. Can everyone uh, see the agenda on the screen? Yes, I can. I, I, yeah, I can't. My screen's too cluttered. <laughs> I should. Ooh. Hey, everybody. Greetings. Hi, Erica. Good to see everybody. Thanks, everyone. All right, you want me to give an update, John? Okay. Yeah, I think you could give an update on Aspen Heights. Sure. The, um, you know, Aspen Heights, it's the new development where Amherst Motel is located on Route 9 behind Domino's. If you go by there, you'll see a new building, a three-story building. And uh, the town's inclusionary zoning bylaw triggered 11 affordable units. So a mix of one, two, and three bedroom units on this development. And they, uh, we just have the application signed by John and Paul to submit those to the state. So we're having, um, you know, the developer has been, they've already started working on their marketing plan and everything. So I think they're trying to lease those up along with the, you know, the market rate together. So they're actually going ahead pretty well with that. So we'll have 11 new units, affordable units, deed restricted units in town. How many is the total units? Uh, the 11 units is 12%. So um, okay. what the total was, I think it might be like 88 um, total. I could probably do the math in reverse, but that's just. <laughs> <laughs> that's close. That's okay. So how, how close is that to completion? Do you have any idea, Nate? I don't. They, um, I think originally they were hoping to be done or, you know, usually the cycle is you want to be leasing in the fall in Amherst, but I think with, co I don't know if they, what they're, if they're ever intended to be leased up this fall, but, you know, definitely by the spring, um, I think they really want to be going on that, so. Okay. Um, you know, they're still moving forward with it. I mean, I, you know, I always wonder with COVID and with the university plans, because most of the other units, I think, will be student rentals, uh, just, with, you know, that's the market, but it seems like they're still moving forward and other projects are too. So they obviously think they can fill the units. Yeah, if not this fall, then in the right. spring or right. whenever. Yep. And then for the other announcement, the uh, John and I have been sitting on interviews. There is a, you know, one opening for the trust. There may be more, um, you know, as other uh, members' um, terms expire, but that's not, you know, right now. So there's one opening and we've, um, gosh, there's probably like seven, seven uh, citizens have completed uh, forms to be interviewed. So we've been doing that today and we'll do that the next few days. So there is interest in, in trust membership, which is great. Yeah, I wish I could tell you more, but all I'll say it's a group of seven very interesting looking people uh what you know right. <laughs> it, it is great it is great and so if people aren't appointed this round then uh assuming there are going to be vacancies in a year which i think is pretty likely uh then hopefully there'll be a couple of that group that hang around and sustain their interest uh but yeah, it seemed like a pretty good group of people um, with sincere interests in affordable housing and with a wide variety of backgrounds. So I thought it was great. 
Any other announcements anybody has? No, but I actually have a question about Aspen Heights and these types of uh, projects. Mm -hmm. um, when these um, apartment complexes uh, are stay empty, are these businesses allowed to take sort of a business uh, shortfall in terms of taxes or other um, expenses that they don't fill the apartments? I mean, is there is there no penalty for filling apartments? Um, well, there's probably a penalty um, to their revenues. That is, they, they're, yeah. getting, they're getting fewer rents in. Um, I don't think they get a reduction in town taxes, do they, Nate? I, um, they, you know, maybe if it's a sustained uh, vacancy, they could maybe apply for an abatement and then they would have to, you know, justify it. But I don't, I don't think that it's just a, you know, the town wouldn't just adjust their taxes because of vacancy. So, you know, unless the landlord or property owner asked for it and had reasons why, but you know, the way a property is assessed, there's, you know, there's, there's a few different ways. So, um, you know, there could be an income approach and then a value approach. So it depends on how this, what, what method the assessor uses. So, um, yeah, I, I couldn't say for sure actually, but. Yeah, I suppose my point is much more of, um, I know that certainly they will take a shortfall if they don't fill the apartments according to how much they're expecting. But when you have people who need apartments and they're empty apartments, is there any way we could pressure people to fill them with people who need them? But, you know, I, I understand that they may not be able to pay the amount. Um, it just seems that there's so much building that's happening here at, at, uh, in Amherst. There seems to be so many apartments being built and it's predominantly being built for students who can afford the prices while people who can't are just being shut out. So I'm just, that was just my thought. So thank you for, you know, let, listening to that. Yeah, no, it's a good thought. I, yeah, I'd like to think that if the vacancies persist that they would reduce prices. I'm not, you know, we can't, the town, I mean, we really can't control the market in that way unless somehow we subsidize units, you know, with that, with funding or, or, we, or we, you know, we could talk to landlords and ask them, um, you know, kind of like with the rental program, we're asking landlords to voluntarily reduce rent if they join the program. So I've heard from some that said they might consider it and others that are like, no way. <laughs> no, you know, no. Yeah, I mean, the part of the, one thing that would trouble me Erica is if they said, okay, we'll give people rents for one year at a reduced rate. And then a year from now, they can get the market rate from students coming in because we're no longer facing the pandemic threat. Then what do you kick people out? Uh, that, that would be a concern to me. Uh, I don't know if anybody else would consider, think of that as a problem. Okay, uh, the next order of business is to review the minutes from August 13th. Uh, John submitted them. I made some minor edits. Uh, sorry? I can pull the, sorry, I was just, I was saying I can switch my screen to make the minutes available if that's helpful. Yeah, it, I think they're too long to review on. Yeah, yeah it's too long. It's like six pages or something. Yeah. It, it's nice that we get a very complete set of minutes. I really like it to go over when I'm planning the next meeting uh, to go back and think about what, if anything, we need to be sure to come back to. Uh, so I find it helpful. I don't know. If other folks find I do too. Very helpful. And especially when you volunteer for something and you didn't remember. So I <laughs> contacted Rita and Rita and I are going to get together. Nate, if you can send me the updated strategic plan, Rita sure. and I are scheduling meetings. <laughs> so thank you for the wonderful minutes.
Yeah, it's always, yeah, it's disappointing when you realize that you said you would do something <laughs> and you forgot. <laughs> It's, it's not, what's disappointing is when you read them so soon to a meeting and say, oops, I can't get it done before the meeting. Um, <laughs> but we'll have something for the next meeting, Rita and I. Yeah, thanks. Any, yeah, the, yeah, the minutes are nice to have that. Any comments on the, uh, on the minutes? Any, anybody see a need to make a change? Okay, then I will assume the Minutes are accepted as submitted, and we can now move on to the next issue, for which I believe Jenna Tetro will be joining us. If she's, uh, she's in the um, audience, I'll promote her to panelists. I think she's here now. Hi, Jenna, welcome. Hi, I'm here. Okay, so we talked a bit about the emergency rental assistance program and potential changes last time. Uh, at this point, I think Jana either has a final report on phase one or close to final report, and uh, also a number of ideas about phase two that uh, uh, Nate, Rita, and I talked with Jana about, which she now has kind of a cogent presentation for. So let me turn the floor over to you. Okay, thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, so I can't remember exactly where we were last time we met, but I'll just give you a quick wrap up of phase one. Um, we had 104 applications. Um, uh, 44, 43, 44 of them were incomplete. Um, and so we ended up with uh, 18 approved uh, applicants, um, 20 were denied uh, for being either over income or having its, uh, sufficient income or assets to pay their rent. Uh, and 22 of them were initially uh, ineligible because they didn't live in Amherst or lived in subsidized housing. There was a few threshold criteria. So of the 18 approved, um, we have been uh, working with their landlords to get uh, pledge letters out to the landlords so that uh, landlords know how much the town is going to pay per month um, and been gathering the documentation. Um, in retrospect, this is a terrible time to be contacting landlords to try to get information from them because September 1st is so busy. And so it's taken us a little longer than I had expected to get the documentation back. So. Tomorrow I am sending to Nate what we have um, because some of the landlords have just had a, uh, they're just taking too long and I don't wanna hold up the ones that have submitted their stuff back. So they sent back um, landlord agreements, which was the document that basically says they agree to accept this money from the Community Preservation Act um, for the tenants. <clears throat> they have, we have W-9s and then we have, um, this sort of invoice type document that says what the tenant owes, which was a little bit, some landlords had trouble with that, but we will, I will have a package for Nate tomorrow. Um, there's the, uh, I, we have three applicants that live at UMass. And so those are taking a little longer to sort through who signs the document. Um, they are UMass students that uh, lived at North Village and have been relocated somewhere else because North Village is under construction. Um, and then uh, South Point has had a turnover in their um, uh, leasing office. And so those are taking a little longer to get back. Um, so we're, we're still, we're getting, I'll get a bunch of that stuff to Nate tomorrow. And then the rent, the rent reduction request letter is gonna go out on Monday to the, the landlords for those 18 applicants. Sid um, could probably sign for UMass, right Sid? <laughs> Uh, wish I could, but no. There would be. I need Don Thompson. If you, Jen, if you need a, a name, I can give you a name. I I have someone's in the bursar's office that we I did send the stuff to last week, and I. Okay. Uh, yep. Bursar yeah. would be great too. Yeah. Yeah, I will Absolutely. follow up. Um, it's just it's you know it's busy in Amherst in September, so I think. Uh, people... Let me know if I need to uh, contact housing and try to push it. Okay. Send me an email, and I'll gladly do that. Yep. No problem. Thank you. Um. So that's kind of the wrap up of round one. Does anyone have questions about 
round one before I talk about round two. Yeah, one question, Jenna. You said you're having difficulty with landlords, which I heard has been reported elsewhere in the state. Is it just because they're busy or are they kind of not on board with the program? No, I think it's they're busy. I, I don't. We haven't had any landlords that have said, "Oh, I don't want your money." <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know, so of the, I mean, most of the tenants live in complexes that. Uh, I mean, I think I, we only have one private landlord. Most of them live in places that you know. I think, you know, either have Section Eight tenants. You know, they're familiar with the idea that another agency might be paying part of their rent. So nobody has seemed concerned or, um, you know, uninterested. I think. It's just we're asking them to fill out some documents and they have, you know, um, at South Point in particular, we have six applicants there and they had a turnover in their leasing office. And so I think it, uh, it's just taking longer, but um, I'm not concerned. I think we will get all 18 processed. Okay, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. John, there's a question, a hand raised in the audience. Great. Why don't you have Check with whoever it is. Sure, yeah. I think, Chad, I think it's you. If you unmute yourself, you can. Yes, I can. Thank you very much. Um, this is just a remarkable time in, in terms of history. Um, it's a hundred year event. Um, I'm wondering if, without any extra work, uh, you know, this is the age of electronics. Uh, whether we can get that information, 114 people or households have applied, 18 have made it. I wonder if we can get uh, that information to the trust. Um, you know, push a button on the lap on the uh, desktop, uh, and send it so that the trust has that information to look at over the next six months to a year. I know it's not going to last forever, but it's some important information you might use. Well, it'll definitely be in the minutes, and um, uh, Jenna is committed to providing updated reports as we go along, as information is available. Well, I'm talking about things like what's their employment, um, what part of town they live in, which buildings, that, and any kind of information. The more mm -hmm. data we have, the better. Okay, we'll talk about that. It's probably until all of the leases are settled. Uh, we may be a couple of weeks off from being able to do that for the first round. Would there, uh, would there be any privacy issues or anything about that? Uh, as long as people aren't identifiable, you know, it's aggregate <laughs> information. It shouldn't be an issue. I mean, you know, it, it makes sense. could be an issue. You have to be cautious about that. Uh, I used to deal with Department of Health data in uh, New York State. And if you had a cell in a matrix that had six or fewer observations, they viewed it as a potential privacy issue with concern that the uh, people involved could be identifiable. So we, we do have to think about whether if we report it in one way or another, you have cell sizes that are quite small and therefore might create some risk of identification. Yeah, I mean, I think some, you know, there we are asking for some demographic information and maybe you know, that would be on staff to run some summary statistics. I'm not sure we've asked community action to do that type of reporting. But, you know, I think it could be useful to have some information, but I agree, you know, I, I'm almost thinking that if we were to have it, I mean, whether or not, you know, where they live may not be as important as is it in, you know, we could say like, you know, a multifamily development of eight or more units or less than eight. And, you know, that we could do it in a few different ways where we're not identifying exactly where uh, people live if, in case, in the case that they could then be identified. So there's probably ways to have the data so the households remain pretty anonymous and we can get some information out of it. If, you know, if, if we, we find that's useful. Um, Okay, I think we should move to phase two or round two. Uh, and we did talk about a number of 
substantive changes to the way uh, we would run the program. And uh, Jana, can you report on what we seem to have settled on? And sure. that's, everybody's on board with that. Sure. Um, most of these changes were in an attempt to um, have the next phase result in more complete applications. Um, and so what we're looking at for round two is um, instead of having the entire application be online, um, which I think for some applicants uh, was confusing, uh, they thought that once they filled that out that maybe they were done and they didn't need to continue submitting documentation or some people I think may have screened themselves out, you know, and, and then didn't move on to complete their application. So what we move, the proposal is to move to a, like a pre-application online. So asking some very basic information about the person, um, you know, kind of actually uh, sort of tying it more to our criteria, our threshold criteria, you know, do you live in Amherst? Um, do you have a COVID related income loss or decrease in income? Um, are you, uh, I added a question, a more sort of general question about, do you, you know, how many people live in your household and are, how many people are students to try to get people to sort of uh, do that in accordance with the criteria for eligibility. And then after they fill that out, then they would be contacted by one of our resource advocate staff to basically do an appointment to complete the application. Um, this is how we normally do financial assistance appointments for other funding sources. And we think that having a little bit more of, a, of contact with the applicants will help answer questions, help people understand what they're applying for, help the staff have a better idea of what the person's situation is so they can sort of troubleshoot if questions come up about eligibility. Um, and then they would, uh, we've been using this you know, we use multiple methods to gather documentation, but we use a uh, sort of an electronic meth system. And some people found that challenging. So having a little bit more hand holding to make sure that the person understands the system or having an alternative and making it clear that they could mail the things or drop them off in a specific office. Uh, most of our offices are not open to clients, but we do have people that drop things off. Um, and so uh, in addition to that part, the other proposal is to move uh, away from the lottery to a first come first serve. Um, doing the longer appointments uh, is a little bit more challenging for in a lottery because the usually a lottery time frame is more condensed. So this would give us more, you know, give the staff more time to have those appointments. Um, we did discuss revisiting the first come first serve on a, you know, maybe after a month just to make sure that we're not you know, if it, the money seems to be going too quickly or we feel like it's, you know, perhaps becoming not equitable, we could, you know, make a change at that time. Um, the other a change uh, to the proposed is to uh, have subsidized tenants be eligible for rent arrears only. And so right now folks can get up to three months of assistance, but also that could include arrears if someone owes arrears. Um, and so we could, the proposal is to allow subsidized tenants to apply for rent arrears only. You can't pay ongoing rent for subsidized tenants, but if they did have arrears, we could do that. Um, we talked about some new marketing strategies, particularly reaching out uh, sort of more personally to some of our larger landlords. Um, and some of the tax credit properties um, that we, I thought personally, we would get a lot of tenants from the tax credit properties and we really didn't. So trying to reach out to Wayfinders um, and Pomeroy Lane Cooperative to make sure that they know about the program. And we are gonna do a special sort of uh, reach out to the incomplete applicants to sort of accelerate them. If they don't have to reapply, they could sort of go right to an appointment and try to get their applications completed if they wanted to do that. Did I, did I miss anything? No, but I think one important thing about the change to first come, first serve, rather than having the lottery, is that people can be processed as soon as they get through right. the application and they have all the documentation. So we don't have to wait to the end of the round uh, in order to be able to do that. Um, we can move people along one by one so that we're doing the most efficient job 
in getting money out there. Do we have any idea of the, with, with the 18 people that already qualified, like how much of the money is gone or so any estimate how many possible people might be able to be helped in the second round? I think last time I looked at it, I think it's about $37,000. Spent. 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 We originally estimated, Carol, that we could serve 60 to 80 households. So okay. if we've only got 18 served so far, uh, that means we'd be able to take uh, 40 to 60 more households, depending on the, what the cost for the, each of those individual households are likely to be. So we have a lot of room. And uh, uh, I think as we've discussed, uh, we have two other somewhat similar sources of revenue available to us if we want to continue or expand the program at a future date. Um, the town is supposed to receive reimbursement for the money that we're spending in this stage. And then the uh, Community Preservation Act Committee has given us an additional $200,000 out of the current year's budget for CPAC that we could apply as well. So depending on how things are going, um, there's even more money potentially available, but that's a decision down the road. Yeah, I, I was just wondering how likely it was that first come first serve would leave us with a lot of people who just couldn't be served. Um, I mean, I think, you know, originally we had the lottery both to satisfy fair housing requirements and, you know, in anticipation of having, you know, actually maybe more applicants than could be funded, but that not being the case, you know, typically after you have a first lottery, it's unusual that you'd have a second lottery. There's usually, you know, we were thinking the first come first serve, there's still, you know, enough funding to accommodate many applicants. So, um, you know, I, I think that is a big change. And the other one is, you know, having the appointment. So it's not when someone first applies, it's when they submit a completed application. And so, you know, speaking with Jana and her team, we felt that doing these appointments would help someone. Because I think before it was an all an online platform. And so someone, you know, you may not um, attach documents, you may not complete the form very well, but then the follow up becomes difficult. You know, there's a lot of back and forth where the hope is if it's, you know, you're speaking with someone, it can be whether or not they have it all at that one time, it's clear what they need to, to, you know, to submit or to finish to complete an application. So that, you know, that's another big change we're hoping will help with the, you know, the percentage of completed applications because you know, I was surprised at how many were incomplete, whether that was just a lack of understanding of the program or they, you know, difficult back and forth. But, you know, to me, it's like if, if I would think that people would want to be in the program. So, it's interesting that some, I think, self-selected out. They thought they were over income or they didn't qualify, but they may may have, but they didn't know it. But then they just didn't follow back up with community action. So I think uh, over the phone is more staff time for them, but may result in, you know, getting more people into the program. I, I guess. Money. I mean, I, <laughs> I'd like to spend it. I guess, uh, um, Jana, you probably have lots of experience because you said you usually do this first come first serve, but it would seem like there need to be a really clear way to establish what the order of coming is. Mm -hmm. So that, the, cause I would like, just not like to see there be some uh, clash or some argument about I was here before you were, no, you were here, some mess that became kind of a mess. And so do people get a get a number when they first start, get a number when they're complete or whatever. It just should be clear how that works and be really clear where in the where in the list or whatever it is that you do. If you've done it before, you probably know how to do this and I'm telling talking about something you're very good at. But it just seems like an important thing to keep straightened out to me. I, I agree that it's important that people understand up front that it's first come first serve. Um, as Nate mentioned, it is based on their completed application. So okay. um, I spent a lot of time today re reworking the uh, our online application to add a lot more instructions in the actual application. Cause I think a lot of people went straight to the link and, and didn't really read what was on the website. Um, 
So usually people, you know, the way that I'm envisioning it working and, and Dana, who's the manager of the program is on vacation. So when she comes back on Monday, we will hash this all out. But I think, uh, when we were doing the lottery system every day, I went into the uh, online application platform and downloaded whoever had filled out an application and then disperse that to the staff to contact them. So I think the same thing would happen is that if someone fills out an online pre-application that, you know, either daily or every other day, I would go in, pull them off, give them to the staff, the staff would call them. And that's sort of when the clock, when they, when they're, they start working on it, you know, um, I think there is a question of how much we chase the person down. And so usually we try to call them, we try to email them. We might send them a letter and says your application is incomplete. You know, you need to call us and finish it. Um, and so that would be something that we would do also. But I think it's hard to tell what the, what the real volume is. And that's sort of why I think, you know, we were all a little surprised that we only ended up with 18 approved applications. Um, I think there's still uh, not a huge sense of urgency out there. And I think that that's going to start changing as we get into the winter months and, you know, maybe some moratoriums start ending. Um, but so, yeah, I think it's something to be that we will definitely keep an eye on. And I, I do think it's important that we are very clear with people that it is first come first serve and, you know, it's, this is how it works. And um, I added a bunch of language to that in the online application today. Okay, Sid, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, I think you kind of answered it a little bit. Um, you know, just to be cautious that first come, first serve English as a second language, mm -hmm. uh, folks sometimes have to get people to help them with that. So that may take a little while mm -hmm. to, um, to get that, that person uh, to, to, to help them do that. So, you know, to, be, to try to be equitable, as equitable as possible to keep that in mind, okay. that some folks may take, you know, a little while to get there. Thank you. Yep. And to piggyback on what Sid said, um, your pre-application, what information is in there that you have assistance uh, for people who uh, may not speak English as their first language, but they may not also be um, people who speak that type of language available to them? Um, so the way that the other, the previous application, it did have something in Spanish that said if you needed help to call the office, because we do have Spanish speaking um, at staff. Um, the, actually, the benefit of having a much shorter pre-application is that we could have the whole thing translated um, into Spanish and potentially something else. The other one was so long that it, was, it wasn't possible for us to really efficiently translate it, but we definitely could translate it into Spanish. Um, if, if, the, if the trust thinks that there's other languages that we should look into to have it translated into, we could certainly look into that um, we don't have staff that speak a lot of other languages, so we would have to use either the language line or, um, you know, have another community organization help us if, if it was Cambodian, for example, because we don't have a staff person that speaks that. Nepali. We have a lot of Nepalis who work at UMass and who live in, in Amherst. Okay. Yeah, and uh, of course, Vietnamese, Cambodian, um, you know, Cape Verdean slash Portuguese, um, you know, some Brazilians also in town. So... Is it um, Laotians? Um, these are the communities that I know. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, yeah, even Russian. I mean, it's amazing how many different languages and dialects are at the schools. But when I spoke with our some people in IT, they thought the way the form was written, it could be um, put into Google and have it. You know, you could have Google translate at least help with the form. It doesn't help necessarily if it's an in-person interview now. But the form was able to be, you know, at least online could be translated. Um, I'm not sure how accurately, but yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, there is the Jones Library has some staff too, or it has resources if we need, if, you know, I haven't, I didn't know that we, I don't know that we've encountered a problem, but you know, we would have, you know, we'd find a way to accommodate uh, anyone who's applying. We didn't, I didn't, we didn't encounter any problems in round one, though I am, would be really interested if any trust members or community members heard that that was a barrier to applying. So if someone didn't apply because it wasn't either in their language or they didn't feel like we'd be able to accommodate them, we didn't get any requests. But, you know, if I would be interested to know if anyone just sort of screened themselves out because they felt like it was not accessible to them. 
I think what you mentioned before, which is uh, more dire straits where people are being laid off, furloughed, and the amount of support that's coming from the federal government has been reduced, mm -hmm. that there's going to be more need. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard from a few um, different town staff and other people saying that there's been a few families, uh, just just a few in last, like two families that are immigrant families in the last uh, two weeks that are facing unemployment now and would really need assistance as of October. So I think, I think it's starting, you know, where there's, you know, it's starting to be felt more. So, you know, I, I was, you know, I was surprised they were looking, I told them round two would be coming. And so they're, they're anxious, you know, so I know there's two new applicants that are waiting. Okay. okay. Um, I'm going to try and quickly summarize the significant changes. Uh, that Jenna mentioned, and you can correct me if I've got it wrong, and then ask everybody uh, to vote whether they are or are not comfortable with making those changes. So, trying to decipher my notes, uh, here's what I have. Um, the, in, the large or complete online application um, will end and instead we'll have a much more streamlined simpler pre-application -app, pre that people need to fill out, which will focus primarily on the eligibility requirements. And then staff will obviously make their best efforts to follow up with people, to talk to them, uh, and to really do their hand-holding in the process of completing all of the requirements for the application and all of the documentation requirements that are part of what needs to be submitted. So basically a, a much more streamlined front end and much more emphasis on giving people assistance at the back end. Um, let's see. Uh, another significant thing is we're moving away from a first come first serve. I'm uh, sorry, we're moving to a first come first served approach rather than the lottery approach so that applications can be processed one by one as quickly as we're able to move forward with each individual applicant rather than waiting to do the entire pool at the end of the round. So hopefully that helps to get money out to folks um, quicker and gives us an, a better idea sooner about how many people we are actually approving and how much money we're spending and also gives us an idea about uh, what we may need to do to expand the program in another round. Uh, Janet didn't talk about this in detail, but we will uh, try to improve our marketing efforts. Um, that's critical. And we're also expanding the eligible pool to people who do have subsidized rents, but only for the purpose of helping them to make up arrears, not uh, current rent requirements. So I think those are the major changes. Did I skip over anything, Jana? I don't think so. Okay, great. So uh, let's see, going around, I'll say I'm in favor of all of those. Uh, Carol? Yep, you're in favor if you raise your hand. Okay. Uh, you're muted, Carol, if you're speaking. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Erica. Yes. Rob. Yes. Sid. Yes. Tom. Yes. And Will. Will. We give a thumbs up. Oh, okay, good. I make sure we're watching. It's a it's a test to know if we're paying attention. Yeah, I don't have everybody's. Uh, portrait on my screen. Oh, all right. <laughs> so I, I, I only hear it when you say it out. Uh, okay, so then we passed. We'll make those changes. Um, you said Donna comes back on Monday. So when we will be make, making the announcement about uh, availability of applications in the next round? Uh, I think um, by the end of next week, I think we'll be ready to uh, get going with that. So I'll have a new flyer for you um, and we'll have uh, a backup on our website, uh, a new link for the survey, the, you know, online, the pre-application um, and 
yeah, so I think uh, I will let you know, but I'm thinking by the end of next week, we'll be ready. Okay, that's great. Any other questions or advice for Jana? Okay, thanks everybody. All right. Um, I, I just, I didn't give any, is there anybody among the non-panelists, the attendees who had a question or a comment about this? I don't, oh yes, there's one hand up. Oh uh, yeah. Um, Chad. Yeah, I just didn't know what it meant by arrears. I guess this is all about uh, uh, costs, rental costs during COVID-19. So that would mean uh, any uh, costs from March, uh, March of this year forward. Uh, yeah, so if people missed rent, because of economic distress caused by COVID-19. And so they are in the position where they have arrears. We're saying we would want to help them. Right, not going back further, right? So it's not like, yeah. Right. 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 Okay, so moving on to our next topic. All right, thanks uh, everybody. Thank you, Jenna, I appreciate right. your work and we'll look forward to the next round. Okay. We will be enrolling people at a quicker rate than we were able to in the first one. Yes. Good night. Good night. Okay. Um, the next major item on our agenda is setting goals for the coming year. Uh, and I actually haven't decided exactly what the best way is to process this. Um, Except, uh, let's see. I, I'm sharing a document um, right now. I sent to John that you sent around. No, this isn't the one that I There's meant. There's something else, isn't it? Yeah, it's actually, it was on screen that you had just on a minute okay. ago. Yeah. All right. Yeah, if you just go down below item three to item four, mm -hmm. that is that. Okay, yeah, that's the list of things that I sent around for people to consider. Uh, at first, I was thinking people would rank priorities, tell us what your best five was, but I wasn't sure that was right. Another thing I was thinking is, well, should we vote on each? Um, as it turns out, um, either during or shortly after the last meeting, a couple of people came forward, specifically Eric and Will, to say there were two areas that they were interested in working on. Erica um, reviewing and potentially proposing changes to our strategic plan, which is now three or four years old, maybe. And uh, Will, uh, wanting to help us get more active with legislative ad advocacy. So my inclination is to say, unless somebody says, well, those are stupid ideas and nobody else wants to do it, um, we should have uh, people go forward with that. Um, so I don't know if uh, I need a vote on any, or we need to vote on, on those items specifically. Um, so I think what we should do is, take the items one by one, talk a little bit about them, and uh, uh, determine uh, if we do want to go forward and who, if anybody else, anybody wants to participate in that. I will say uh, the first item, which I do want to talk about, evaluating additional town property for affordable housing, um, primarily falls on staff uh, because uh, the evaluations require not necessarily that Nate or somebody else go out to the property, although it may include that, but more specifically that we have uh, experts, consultants, um, review the property for wetlands issues, for um, the ease with which we can use the property, that is be able to move forward with construction uh, or other issues related to 
really barriers to creating affordable housing on those sites. Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, yeah, I, I do think that um, um, Habitat for Humanity, you know, is looking to do a project in Amherst. So, you know, every few years when they wrap up projects, they go through a cycle. And so they contacted the town and, you know, we, we worked with them to look at a few properties uh, last year or the year before. And nothing was, you know, fruitful for them, but that's always a possibility. There's the Amherst Community Land Trust. So there are a few entities, whether it's, um, you know, town owned property, the town necessarily doesn't own a lot of property, but there could be other properties that could be uh, made available for um, other entities. So, you know, I think whether or not there's a subcommittee on it, although staff tries to coordinate it, if, you know, if any trust member has ideas, feel free to either bring it up at a meeting or send me an email. So, you know, whether it's a private property that may come on the market or, you know, there's an owner or some property that you think looks good, um, you know, Strong Street and Hickory Ridge are some that uh, are have potentials and there could be more that the town owns, but you know, I just want to put it out there that there could be private property too or others that we could help try to facilitate things if there's, you know, between different developers or nonprofits. So you're yeah. also talking about available lots? Yeah, so for instance, like on uh, Pomeroy Lane a few years ago, there was a vacant lot. And, you know, we reached out to the owner, we talked to Habitat, you know, we just, we, you know, we, we, the town moves pretty slowly as a, as a potential buyer, but at least we, you know, we, when we reached out to the owner, you know, we'd have to do wetlands and a few things, but we asked Habitat, you know, if the town, for instance, purchased the property or entered into personal sale agreement, would Habitat be interested in putting a, uh, you know, a unit there, or two units or something, just so, you know, not that we'd flip it, but, you know, we could own it or do something. So, you know, even something like that. Um, you know, for instance, like if there's another one in Pomeroy that had a lot of wetlands and we'd be willing to take the wetlands as conservation land and then deed over buildable area. I mean, there's, you know, there's ways to do it. It doesn't, uh, Hickory Ridge is kind of like that. You know, a lot of the property can't be developed, but there may be four or five, I don't know, so many, a few acres, right? four to seven acres, four to eight acres, I'm not sure that could be buildable. Right. Well, the reason why I ask is on Route 67, there's a corner lot that's been open for a while. I mean, it's Jones has their sign up, but it's a pretty big lot. Um, is that not, not on Pulp, is that on Pulpit Hill? The corner of Pulpit Hill or? I think so, I don't, yes, where the co-housing goes to? Yeah. Yep. That's a pretty big piece of land. It is. Yeah, there's been some discussions around that. I don't know about the neighborhood, but I live in the neighborhood. I'd be for it. Habitat. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, thanks, thanks. Yeah. I'll be looking out for more property. <laughs> yeah, I used to drive around a lot more and just look at properties and then, oh, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was under the misperception that we could only use uh, Amherst Town properties. So now I'll start looking for property. When, you know, if the town already owns it, the idea is that's you know one less barrier, right? But but if there's something out there that may you know um, seem like something the town could work with. Okay. Any comments or further thoughts on item A? Yeah, I think we all need to uh, put pressure on town staff <laughs> to uh, do those contracts, whether it's for the E Street site, which isn't mentioned here, but is already underway, or Strong Street, and uh, when there is a process developed for Hickory Ridge. We want to move forward for these things, get stuff into the pipeline as quickly as we possibly can. I mean, it's great that 132 Northampton Road or the Amherst Studio Apartments are moving forward. Uh, not exactly speedily, but at least they're progressing. Um, but we need to get more into the pipeline. Yeah, I will say, yeah, um, you know, there's number five below, but East Street School, we are having um, the Wellens Consultant come out next week. And then I've asked for quotes for the hazmat of the building. But um, what I was going to say with regard to town on property, the there is a, um, 
uh, surplus property um, process now. So my thought would be, you know, the trust has talked about Strong Street and Hickory Ridge, but if, uh, if the trust wants to move it forward, there could be a memo to the town manager, town manager's office uh, asking that, you know, these sites be looked at for affordable housing, you know, as a little bit of a nudge, because there is this committee that would meet and then help evaluate it. Um, so that, that is a process now that's been formally, that, that the town has for, you know, surplus, for property to determine if it's surplus. So I think, um, you know, if there's other town owned property, and we could have more of this could be a separate agenda item in the future, but I think the trust could write a letter to that group or to the town manager and ask that these properties be evaluated for affordable housing as a priority and just try to see if that gets traction. Yeah, I had at least a verbal agreement with Dave Zomek to do that a year ago. I guess things have moved away from that agreement. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure it has. It's just because it's been so long, John. And, you know, um, for instance, Hickory Ridge, I'm not sure the town, uh, I don't think the town owns it yet. We thought that was going to happen, I guess, months ago too. So right. it's just, you know. No, I understand the delay on Hickory Ridge until the town takes possession of it. That we really can't move forward. Right. And I know also Dave plans a public process to talk about what should be done with that property. There's two hand raised, John, in the audience. Oh, okay. Uh, a lot more. You can unmute yourself. Yeah. I thought that the Habitat rejected Strong Street a long time ago. I think they. they, they there was there was, you know, we looked at uh, Strong Street and a few other properties, and for them, it was the co the additional cost of bringing utilities or infrastructure to the site. And so they didn't say no outright, but you know, if, if the other costs could be shared or, or spread out, then they, you know, they would probably be interested in the site. So that's just something that you know, would be part of the assessment of those properties. You know, what, what are those costs? You know, how much is it to bring water, sewer, uh, paving? You know, it's a I don't know if it's a private road or a common driveway at this point, but you know what? What is that, what are all those costs to make the site developable for for someone? So, yeah, it's also probably too large a site for a habitat project. If we're going to do something with the site, maybe they can carve out a particular plot or two for a habitat project, um, but that wouldn't fill the site. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. We talked about this a while ago, and Rob had a good idea too. Of even could the trust sell some of the lots at market uh, and have a mixed income development there. So, you know, there's ways to recoup costs if a lot of it's borne by the town. I think Strong Street has some potential to, because it was a, a subdivision originally and um, I forget how, you know, a number of lots, I'm not sure how many are buildable, but yeah, there, I think, you know, if the trust wants that, um, I think we could, you know, uh, we had done a little research. I, you know, I talked to DPW and Reed and I looked at utilities. I mean, I think we have to just dig it all up again and try to, you know, get it presented to the trust and see if we want to move it forward on that. But. Okay, well, I will draft a note um, uh, to send to the town manager with a copy to Dave Zomek. Um, I, uh, is everybody well, we should vote on this. Is everybody comfortable or everybody in favor of our doing that with respect to Strong Street? Okay, we can just quickly run by um, those people who are present. Uh, I'm in favor. Carol? In favor. Erica? Yes. Did? Yes. Rob? Yes. Tom? Um, Tom Wade said yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. Uh, thanks. Will? We'll give a thumbs up. He's good. Okay, good. Thank you. And then look so, like, um, okay. Chad had his hand raised. Chad, I think you can just unmute yourself too. All right. Yeah, three things. One for Erica, that uh, property across from Pioneer Valley Co-housing is owned by some of the people in the co-housing. Um, they would like to develop... Um, aged co-housing. Um, 
I think they're tired of the uh, pitter patter a little feet across the street and want to want to move over there for a 55 and older community. Um, doesn't mean they won't sell it. Uh, I'm wondering if Strong Street, uh, we right now have um, duplexes by right. I don't know if two duplexes could fit in there. Um, and the third point was, um, I don't know if this fits under A or C, uh, new goal, uh, housing goals, um, but um, for the past 20 or 30 years, uh, national um, affordable housing has moved away from things like um, what we have on Kellogg Street, um, uh, you know, the monolithic and uh, Amherst is now at the point of what builders call infill. Um, I think one of these uh, A through I could fit into um, affordable housing one by one, the way um, Amherst Community Land Trust does it, the way Habitat for Humanity does it, um, in single houses and duplexes and those kinds of things. I'd love to see like what's happening at Aspen, 12% goes into um, you know, affordable housing, but th there's other ways to do affordable housing as well. Okay, thanks, Chad. Um, I think we'll go on to item B now. Uh, I don't have a lot to say about that. It's something that we started before we moved to the emergency rental assistance program, and that kind of took all our energy. And my feeling is that we still have things to learn through that program. Um, but I, uh, and we, we did have a subcommittee established uh, to look at creating a local housing voucher program. So I think we would reconvene that group uh, maybe in three months or something like that after we've gone through the next round of emergency rental assistance, unless people feel that we should move, try to move on that more quickly. Are you, our clarifying question, a plan for an all go, ongoing rental assistance program, local housing vouchers, is different, right, than a subcommittee improving access to rental housing. Those seem like two different things to me, or at least when I thought I was on that subcommittee, I didn't know we were trying to create that, a program like that, so I'm, Hello. That was the subcommittee's genius, Carol, that they were going to come up with a whole program that you didn't know you were doing. That was, that was <laughs> yeah, I'm on that subcommittee, so this is news to me too. <laughs> actually, actually, Carol, I will say you're right. Um, but actually, okay. the reason you're right is that improving access to rental housing is in fact a broader topic than creating an ongoing rental assistance program. Because among the things we talked about, was assuming it's gonna be available sometime in the near future using the Housing Navigator program that's being developed, uh, which would be a way of improving access. Another way of improving access would be to create an ongoing rental assistance program uh, or local housing voucher. So yeah, all of those things would be up for discussion. I think a local voucher program, you know, we had Tom, Tom had reached out to Wayfinders and they, I think this was it, and they were agreed that they could possibly administer it, but you know, we said it would be, be nice to have like a regional town. I mean, that was a waiting list, but in any event, I think it is different than uh, access. And I think um, it would take a little bit of work. So, you know, whether or not the subcommittee, uh, the access, ha um, improving access focuses on this as a project, it would become a project. and. I will say that the town, um, through block grant a few years ago, and then more recently through general funds, offered emergency funds to um, residents, whether it's for rental assistance or sometimes utilities. Uh, I think that's ending. Um, so you know, it's twenty thousand a year, twenty five thousand a year, and I think that's taking a different form next year. So I've had a few people ask, well, who, you know, what kind of assistance would there be for? Um, if it's not, you know, a formal program like we're doing right now, is there going to be some type of program um, available if someone has rental arrears or utility um, arrears? And so 
I don't know if this local housing voucher program would do that, but I think there is, um, in recent years, all those types of programs have disappeared. So funding has disappeared. So, you know, it used to be that maybe Family Outreach had some funding or, um, you know, Community Action had some programs and there still, there still are some, but it's less and less each year. So, you know, we had thought this local housing voucher might be 300 a month for up to two years, right, John? I think there's some, some, some discussion we had in that it was really meant to be a bridge for households. And so, you know, money's fungible. So if you're short on utilities, maybe, you know, you, if you can pay more of your rent, then you have money for utilities. But I think there might be a need for this beyond the formal emergency program we have. You know, we've had requests. I'm not saying it, you know, I don't know who, you know, if someone wants to take it on, but I think we'd had done a little, a little research on this. And yeah, and there are, there's at least one or two programs on the cake right. that do this. And so I consider that to be part of the agenda potentially for improving access to rental housing. All right. Anyway, I guess the question really is, uh, I, I see us doing this. As I said, I just sort of see it happening uh, maybe three months down the road rather than right away. Are there concerns about that? I, I guess I just would say that a local housing voucher program seems way different than what I thought we were trying to do before. I don't think it's a bad idea. I just think it's different than what at least I thought we were trying to do, which was to just look at what's out there and how, how might it work better for people and what because if you can't do a local housing voucher program without money and whatever we were doing didn't seem to me like we were trying to figure out a money source to do it with. So it's just different. That's all. Well, I, it's something for the subcommittee to take up then okay. <laughs> when we reconvene. Okay, everybody, there were several of us that are involved in that subcommittee. Is there anybody who doesn't doesn't want us to go forward with that. I, John, I'm, I'm not going to say don't do it, but I just think it might be worth an analysis to say, okay, if you've got, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars and you used it to leverage an affordable housing project that then saved uh, renters, you know, $50,000 a year in rent for the next 30 years, um, or you use that to support uh, tenants, you know, for a year on their um, a rental subsidy, which gets you the better bang for your buck. Yeah. I think that's a good the only thing I would not. suggest is to, to look at it and see which is the best use of your money. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other comments on B? Okay, then we'll move on to C, which uh, Erica has already said she's willing to work on, uh, probably with Rita. Uh, any other questions or comments about that? Erica, do you want to say anything more about it? Um, no, um, I assume that Rita has the most updated strategic plan. I think um, I had asked for that just to make sure we're working with the most updated document, but I just assume she has it. Um, so we connected um, after reading the minutes. Uh, I contacted her and we sort of both fell off our radar. Um, so she's very excited. Uh, and so we're making plans uh, to schedule time and have something ready for our next meeting. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, Will and I talked about more active legislative advocacy since he expressed interest in that. Um, that was only about a week ago, so I don't expect to have a report today. But Will, do you want to say something about that? Will? Well, I'm not sure we can hear you. Uh, you're unmuted. You're, you're, you're muted now, but you're unmuted, but maybe your microphone's not catching. 
has to fight for my kid. I'm going to mute myself. Can't hear you. <laughs> His microphone's not working. Yeah. Okay. He's just saying a okay. Well, I could just say I've given Will my contacts, people I rely on for information about what's going on with the legislator, including Joe Comerford and Mindy Dom, uh, but others as well. And so He'll be following up and uh, at our next meeting, he may have some suggestions for what we might want to do to become more active as advocates for legislation. Okay, then we come to E. We developed a draft affordable housing town policy. We presented it to town council. Town Council essentially has tabled it, um, saying that it really needs to be not a standalone document, but something that would be incorporated into a more general town housing policy. Uh, that all happened maybe eight months ago. Uh, and Town Council, particularly the, specifically I should, the Community Resource Committee has now taken up the question of what should be in a general town housing policy. Um, but they've, they've got a ways to go, let me put it that way. Uh, so one thought I had is there were a lot of comments about the affordable housing policy. I've also gotten some from an outside consultant through CHAPA. And I was wondering if anybody had any interest in taking some time to redraft the original draft and if town council hasn't moved on a general town housing policy uh, say two or three four months from now we bring it back to them and said we've made some revisions and we think you should uh, reconsider adopting this now so there's really two questions. One is, does anybody think that's a good idea? <laughs> and the other question is, does anybody think it's a good enough idea that they'd like to participate in a process to do that? I think I'll just jump in quickly. The um, John, would that go uh, a little hand in hand with the update and the strategic plan? I'd like to think that they're both synchronized. Um, yes. And the, the context also I'd say is that the uh, planning department is looking at um updating zoning and then updating the master plan in the next year year and a half uh not a rewrite of the master plan but an update and so i know the community resource committee has looked at that a little bit so i think um whether or not the a town policy on housing gets affordable housing gets adopted but i think having it be you know part of the conversation now could at least help inform all these other processes so you know um you know, even if it's just a simple goal they set or they have some measures, I just, you know, I want to, you know, I think the town's done a few things, but there's more that could happen. So, you know, I think just if someone's willing to take it and um, like John said, it may need to be that you work to get on an agenda here and there and just to keep it as part of the conversation, you know, so it doesn't sit for another eight months or a year, but. Yeah, I, I was under the impression that town council within the last couple of weeks, Nate, voted against having the CRC do any further work on the master plan. I thought that was also tabled. What? I, I'm not sure. I thought we, I thought in, um, I don't go to their meetings, but I thought we were, um, planning staff just went just the other week to talk about a few topics, um, both master plan related and capital projects, um, but. You know, it looks like Maura raised her hand. She may actually have been at the meeting. Um, okay. I'm not aware of that. Maura, you can, um, I think if you unmute yourself. Yeah, they decided to concentrate on zoning and just accept the master plan as it is for now. Although, and the planning board also voted that way unanimously. So um, the zoning is the next big thing up for the CRC. 
Okay, yeah. No, thanks. That's interesting. At one point, there had been a discussion about what leads what. You know, do you change, update your master plan or your zone? If what follows doesn't need to follow in any order. So, sounds like they would like to focus on zoning. Yeah. Well, that makes me think that some combination of E and F uh, would be good for us to be looking at. Because one would hope that, I mean, I would hope all these things, the strategic plan, the master plan, the affordable housing plan, and the zoning bylaws all work together into the, going in the same direction and for the same purposes. And I guess I don't know exactly where the process should start. But if the, if the town council is going to be looking at zoning reviews, then I think we should put together E and F. And if we put them together in some kind of way, I'll try to help. I personally keep going back and forth about whether that's a good idea or not, honestly, Carol. And whenever I raise it with our zoning expert, who's Rob, uh, he basically says, that's not really something that we as a group, that is the housing trust, should get deeply involved in. It's really the business of the zoning board. And it's not that we can't comment or offer ideas, but uh, Rob has, I think, sensibly discouraged me from going in that direction. Rob, do you want to say anything about that? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess I guess I was. I agree with what you said. Um, I think that. Um, Creating an a, a overall housing policy, which I think um, really means an affordable housing policy, but if they want to call it a town housing policy, that's fine, um, is, is what will um, eventually lead to or justify zoning reforms. Um, but to start with zoning reforms, you know that's 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 an ongoing process that's been going on for you know forever, um, and and you really need a consensus or agreement about where housing can go, where more housing can go, and how what form it should take before you start um, proposing bylaw changes. And there and there really is not any consensus about that, about where housing should go and what it should look like. So, um, what, can I ask? What? I was just, would you see those two things, what housing should look like and where it should go, as something that should be addressed as part of an affordable housing policy? Who would address that part? I think um, in, in, in the past, it would have been the planning board and its zoning subcommittee and then town meeting. Um, you know, proposing something that that would change how how um, housing is 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 made possible. For instance, the the zoning changes that were proposed over the last ten years that that led to uh, the buildings downtown, which now people don't like. And so, so you know, if if you don't like that, can you imagine trying to propose expanded housing anywhere else. It's hard to imagine that. So there, there, so, so I think now the ball is in the town council's court. It appears that they have grabbed zoning away from planning board and are gonna do it themselves. So, so they have to come up with, and presumably they, as elected, um, an elected body, they will, they, will, they will voice their constituents' desires they will have to come up with a uh, consensus, a plan, a vision that, that says, this is, this is where housing should be. This is how it should look like. This is how we're gonna accomplish it through zoning, through subsidies or whatever. Um, I don't think that anyone has any uh, objection or, or, or doubt about the need for affordable housing. So our, um, our suggestions about affordable housing 
you know, I, I, th I don't think people disagree with them. It's just not uh, helpful to the conversation overall because it, because it just says something that we already know. Yes, we need affordable housing. Um, yeah, I mean, I would, sorry, John, I was gonna jump in. I think the, um, um, you know, Carol, I think the policy, we had a few metrics to try to have some, some measurable, you know, goals or, you know, parts, but usually a policy is a little more general to me than having such specifics as where and what it'll look like. But um, I thought the policy was pretty good. I don't know what revisions it will go through. Um, in terms of zoning, Rob's right, except that, um, you know, Chad mentioned, you know, infill development and, you know, for instance, I think right now, um, the town zoning doesn't really allow multifamily in a lot of places, or it doesn't allow different types of multifamily. So it's pretty restrictive in terms of town houses or different types of housing. It has a really old definition for apartments. So, you know, you can't have more than 20 units in apartments and, you know, so, I mean, we could have a, a, this could be a future agenda item, but my thought would be whether or not the trust, right, tries to write zoning, but we could have a memo to the planning board or community resource committee and just highlight a few things that, you know, we think having, you know, affordable housing and mixed income housing integrated in the community is important, not just in isolated developments, for instance. So we think that all new development could have some mixed income. We would like to have multifamily or different types of units throughout town. And just, you know, I think there could be general points that could be then brought to bear through zoning and not get into the specifics of what are, right, I mean, it would take a really long time to say, okay, what do we want the building to look like downtown? You know, we just went through this 40R process and now people are saying they don't want it when, you know, it, prov it could provide some design guidelines and a lot of tools that people had said they wanted originally. So I. I don't want to get caught up in that as a trust, but maybe having just a few general points to be made just for consideration. I, you know, I'm, I'm sure they're aware of it, but I just, you know, it's always nice to have, have it reiterated. Yeah, yeah that, that makes sense to me. I agree with that. I would, I would be yeah. interested in working on that. Yeah, I, I would too, just to have, you know, maybe a summary document that would just maybe go around. Yeah, okay. I would. If I could be any help, I would be interested in being helpful in working on that. Yeah, I do agree, Carol. Zoning is enormously important, but I think there are a lot of barriers to our getting too deeply involved in that. But if people are comfortable with following through on the idea that Nate suggested and that Rob seconded, I'm fine with that as well. Okay, so we can do some work potentially on uh looking at key ideas that would affect changes in the zoning bylaws without trying to propose specific bylaw changes yeah that makes sense to me okay so it looks like we have uh enough at least a couple of people carol and rob who are interested in f and so i think we'll move forward with that uh, then I have G, reconvening the homelessness committee. That committee existed pre-COVID and it consisted mainly of uh, Jay Levy, Nancy Schroeder, and Erin Cassidy, who people may or may not know. She's in charge of the housing mobile voucher program for the Amherst Housing Authority. And then also myself. Um, we stopped meeting. Uh, really when everything was interrupted and haven't reconvened. Um, since then, Jay and Nancy have both left the housing trust. Uh, so I need to see where they are. Um, but I also wanna know if anybody else is interested in getting involved uh, with the issues of homelessness. Basically what we were talking about in that group among other things was trying to find some financing to support uh, care coordinators for people who are homeless in Amherst. Uh, and Jay's been working on a source of funding that his organization has adopted so that he thinks he's gonna be able to expand the number of coordinators, uh, not just in Amherst, but in Hampshire County 
uh, through Elliott Homeless Services. And there may be other things we could do to try to support Craig's Doors or Craig's Place. Uh, and uh, to promote better access to existing housing in Amherst for people who are homeless. So that's my brief pitch regarding G. Any comments, questions? Okay, well, uh, if, I, if, if I can find people who are interested in that, even outside the housing trust membership per se, then we may move forward on it. It is one of the things that is part of our so-called charter responsibility under the housing trust bylaw. Okay, let's move on to item H, which is a new item. Um, I think I sent people some information I got from Maura Keen about that issue. Um, so Maura, do you want an opportunity to talk about that? Um, yeah, I just had been, I, somebody had drawn attention to me that a number of houses in Orchard Valley were bought by um, a couple of people who then rented them out to students. Um, and I had just started looking into it. John said the same thing happened in his neighborhood. And I know when I was canvassing once with Kathy Shane up at Rolling Ridge, almost every house there was a student rental. So I was wondering, these are the homes that um, families, young families can afford to buy. They're modest homes, but in nice neighborhoods, uh, family neighborhoods. And Nate, I know, said that there were some things in the zoning bylaw that could protect them, but I've just started to look into it and apparently talking to Paige Wilder who wrote that um, those points that John's circulated, uh, she had a lot of advocacy with the neighbors going to a lot of meetings and bringing things up to get her local neighborhood made into a local historic district, I believe, which um, minimizes the amount of uh, conversion to student housing that's allowed. So I don't know, I'm, I'm very interested in keeping these neighborhoods affordable and for families, but I haven't, I'm just started to look into it and would be happy to keep working on it. I will mention that CPA funds at this point, two small uh, home ownership programs uh, as part of their affordable housing initiatives. One for the Amherst Community Land Trust, which I think has funding to create two homeowner units. Yeah. And uh, then Valley Community Development, which has funding uh, to create three or four homeowner units. Can't remember. I think it's it? four. You think it's four? Yeah, that's what I think too. I just wasn't sure. So there, there are initiatives that fit with this but honestly, they are expensive to do. And it's hard to find qualified applicants too, I guess, or to match them up. Either you get someone who's qualified and they can't find a house in the right price range, or they have houses that are for sale, but they don't, there are no applicants at that time that meet the guidelines. Yeah. The person who most familiar with all of this is Donna Cabana, who works for Valley Community Development. Donna ran the first program that Valley had with CPA funding, which did successfully uh, place four households or families in homes in Amherst, which they were able to pur purchase with support from CPA funds. And they now have a second program, which Donna's working on. And she's also collaborating with ACLT, uh, providing some consultation to them in trying to get their program working. So the person to talk to is Donna Cabana. Uh, I, 
I worked with Donna. We also did it with block grant money, but CDBG has um, stricter regulations on assets, so it was actually hard to qualify households. I, you know, the um, 2015 housing market study. It wasn't the affordable, it wasn't the housing production plan, but we had a comprehensive housing market study. Uh, the consultants there, RKG Associates, you know, thought that there was some some zoning and regulatory measures that other states had used to try to you know, strengthen some areas for student housing and then make it more difficult in other uh, neighborhoods to, you know, deter student rentals. And whether or not we could have that in Massachusetts, you know, whether it would violate any state regulations or fair housing issues, um, you know, it, it is in the housing uh, market study. I do think that's a, you know, it'd always be great to have neighborhoods remain, you know, a mix of different tenants and homeowners and occupants. It's really hard. The, um, you know, the local historic district by itself doesn't prevent conversion. What it does is it prevents changes from the exterior without going through a review by the this historic district commission that looks at architecture. So maybe landlords are less apt, you know, or property managers don't want to buy in those areas because they don't want to go through that review if they make changes, but it doesn't prevent um, the change, you know, it doesn't prevent someone. I mean, it is hard with Valley. We found that in a certain price range where income eligible households can afford, people will, you know, investor owners will come with cash, you know, and they'll, they can buy something outright. Um, no banks necessary. It's just a quicker process. And the homeowner is really, you know, there has to, whether, you know, whether they're willing to work with Valley because they want to have an affordable house or have a family live there, you know, it's almost like you have to have um, outreach and education beforehand and have advocacy around that. So, you know, it's hard to say no to someone who's going to give you $50,000 more in cash than, okay, well, let's work with someone and it might take three months and, um, you know, less money. So, you know, I think what Paige and some, you know, some of the neighborhoods did, they, they did, they really worked with property owners to make them aware that there is an opportunity to have families live in your house, but, you know, you may be willing, you have to be willing to do that. And, um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. It's, I'm not sure like what it'd be interesting to know like what other tools are there, you know, incentives, regulations, you know, education. I'm sure there's a, a bunch of them that would work together, but uh, you know, even the Valley with CPA, it allows a higher income range, but you know, there's been, you know, it's been difficult to find homes because the ones that are desirable more than one party wants. So we've even had some, some of the last home buyer program we had, we had two first time home buyers, going after the same home. You know, they didn't know that, but you know, at the time they both liked the same property. And so, you know, we we're like, wow, okay, it's a nice property, but how, how, you know, if one gets it and the other one doesn't, how do you help out the other one? But um, yeah, I think to me, it, it's more about like, right, how do we maintain diverse housing in our neighborhoods and be, you know, broadened beyond just not students. But. John, I just had one comment, which is that you've got this huge elephant um, in uh, UMass generating um, an enormous demand for this housing off campus um, as the uh, rates for the rentals of the dormitories goes up and the associated fees, the students find it uh, more advantageous to find off campus housing. They, they're have fewer restrictions and they can live in a manner that has, uh, is more comfortable for them in, in these group settings within these, these uh, single family homes. And uh, the landlords are happy to accommodate and uh, you know, it works, it, it, it works for them. And this is, it, it's, a, it's an incredibly powerful engine driving those students into these neighborhoods. And I'm not sure that any, um, you know, um, neighborhood preservation program that tries to, you know, convince people to, when well, we had our next door neighbor, you know, she tried, tried and tried and ended up selling to an investor. And, uh, you know, they got five unrelated kids uh, in there and, uh, they're good kids and they keep quiet. And I really think that um, what was done around the, um, uh, I forget the name of the, 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 the regulatory change that uh, registered the rental property owners and provides for a certain amount of um, regulation. I think uh, 
you know, anecdotally, I think it's done a lot. I, I see a lot less um, trash on the yards. I see a, a lot less uh, problems. And, um, you know, as one of our members used to say, it's not the students, it's the, um, what, what, did he, what did he call, what did Greg call them? Um, inexperienced renters. <laughs> And we need to be able to uh, make sure that uh, um, the managers, the property managers, the landlords uh, enforce the, the leases and, and make sure the kids obey the rules. And, uh, and that'll go a long way to, uh, to fixing what many of the neighbors complain about. You know, kids pissing in their rose bushes, driving on the lawns, leaving trash out there. Um, it's hard and, and it's gonna require a lot of uh, work. And, and I don't know if there's a way to bolster the uh, town's enforcement arm, maybe getting more money out there to have uh, people driving around and checking on these properties. But um, it's, I, I, I don't think you're gonna change that, uh, you know, tsunami of uh, conversions with any kind of, uh, in a reform like you're talking about. Yeah, well, I noticed Janet, Janet McGowan has her hand up and is, I know is interested in this issue. So Janet, can you unmute yourself and join us please? Well, it's actually me again. No, no, there's also Janet. Hi, I finally, I found the mute button, thank you. Um, I do think that the UMass is the elephant in the room in that they've added about 4,000 students in the last 10 years, but they haven't added housing for the 4,000 students or beds for them. Right. And so um, when, when the um, housing plans came out, the market study, they were saying in that study, you can't say, you know, the student, you know, they were sort of saying, it, the, the realtors were saying it goes back and forth. Sometimes it's first time home buyers buying the lower, cheaper houses. Sometimes it's investor properties, but I think in the last 10 years, and the, the expectation in those studies was that Amherst's population would be flat. And so we have 4,000 more students living in or at, attending UMass, and that's a huge amount of pressure on the rental market. And so I know that part of the housing policy that you were proposing was that UMass build more dorms for its housing, or, or it could be married student housing, or it could be townhouses that are more attractive to, um, to student renters. Um, the other thing is, is that if you're gonna talk about having more multifamily houses throughout the entire town, I think very few people, um, it's not gonna help stabilizing neighborhoods and keeping families in neighborhoods. If you have a three family house and there's 12 students in it and 10 cars parked uh, you know, in the driveway. And so I think that you know, it's like all these things are related to each other. And so I think that, you know, I wouldn't, in, you know, I'm, I'm not against multifamily houses. I don't want to live next to or be surrounded by, you know, three family units with filled with students and cars. And I think most people would share that view. It is legal to say that I will not rent to students. And so I wonder if we did go to multifamily houses, if the requirement is either you own or occupy it at least one of those units or that you're not renting to students. And that would open up more space for um, not just families, but you know, people who work in couples and things like that. And so I think a lot of these issues are very interrelated, but without UMass sitting at the table or some pressure on them to build dorms for their um, students or, you know, townhouses, I think we're just going to be in this like kind of, you know, race of just constantly building houses, seeing pressure, um, you know, and forces sort of beyond our control. I think they're very related. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Yeah, it's kind of discouraging having made a number of attempts to talk to people at UMass. Uh, I haven't figured out a strategy, uh, not for getting them to be able to listen, but getting them to be able to change their own policies. It's not clear how you do that, um, at least to me. Uh, I also live in a neighborhood where uh, about a quarter or maybe a third of the houses are student rentals. 
And as Tom was saying, they're not actually bad neighbors. I really can't object to what they do with their houses. My principal concern is that we are driving out uh, young families from the community because housing that historically would have been occupied by younger families is no longer available to them at a reasonable price. And as a consequence, we have many fewer kids in our schools and many fewer families in Amherst. Uh, I did a project with uh, uh, Valley planning folks a few years ago and we estimated there were 800 fewer families living in Amherst since the year 2000 uh, based on census data. So that's, that's a huge change. Uh, and I do feel a little discouraged even as I kind of wonder why I'm talking about it. I think I've raised this before and it's probably, I don't know if it's ever feasible, but it's almost like you need an excise tax for every student that they enroll that's not living in a dorm. And that, you know, the town needs to be able to collect that. I mean, I know they're a nonprofit. I know they get, you know, tax exemption. I know they, they give you uh, Amherst money as well, but they're, you know, you've got to figure out some solution. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, they're, my understanding is, is that, you know, there, there's a tax on your car insurance to pay for police training. So there, there are formulas of doing these types of things that seem sort of outrageous, but um, somebody's got to start. Well, uh, I know more is interested in working on this. Uh, the people who work on this don't have to be housing trust members, or it can be a mix of housing trust members and people outside the trust. So if anybody is interested, we can form a subcommittee, formally or informally, um, that wants to kind of come up with ways to, new ways to manage this problem. I think, Nate, you had talked about um, in Philadelphia that there was some sort of movement um, to try to keep neighborhoods intact, especially, um, you know, lower income neighborhoods in terms of students moving in. So there might be some models out there or, you know, places that have sort of pushed back around gentrification. Maybe there's some models out there that we can look at. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, Philly is right. That, yeah, now that you said that or it did remind me, I think yeah, I mean, it's difficult because typically local regulations don't, um, you know, don't prescribe who lives there. You know, we don't get into tenants collection. So, you know, um, my thought would be that, for instance, inclusionary zoning, like at Aspen Heights, who I mentioned earlier, you know, the 11 units will be affordable units and maybe there's 88 units in that development. So maybe that 11 units are going to be rented by non-students, the affordable units, and every other unit is going to be students. And so I'm just, I don't know if that's the case, but, you know, depending on price points, then, you know, it's difficult to have other families or, you know, households live in the market rate units if they're, if they're pretty expensive. So, you know, whether that means we have to have a higher percentage of inclusionary, um, inclusionary zoning, you know, affordable units or, you know, our, our I, yeah, I'm not sure, you know, I think there's probably needs to be a combination of, of, of approaches, but, you know, we don't, we're, you know, when someone comes in and says they're going to build 100 units of a mixed use building, you know, we can't really say, well, you can't rent, it's really difficult to say you can't rent those to students, you know, none of those can be for students, so you need to have a mix of some students and non students and so you know, but maybe there are some some other ways to approach it. Maybe there are some regulations that we could test out, you know, that other states allow that we haven't tried. I, yeah, I haven't, I haven't done enough research to know for sure. But yeah, like Temple, around Temple, they, I guess they did a few things that exactly. seemed to be pretty effective. Yeah, the city of Philadelphia had some regulations that were supposed to protect against gentrification of neighborhoods around Temple University. Exactly. I, I don't think this is a gentrification issue, though, right? This is almost the opposite. It's, it, people are afraid that it's de-gentrifying their neighborhoods. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, 
Right, but we could learn from some of those models. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, Tom. It's interesting, you know, if they're nice, if they behave, you know, it doesn't make a difference who, who lives there. But it is interesting that, you know, less families, it seems like, are living in Amherst as possibly a result of more students occupying homes. And it's hard to say that definitively. There are other reasons, whether it's, a, you know, the economy or jobs and, you know, there's more, more factors. But, um, you know, if the university does grow and more students live off campus, it does diminish the supply of houses for non-students. And so, you know, well, I, I feel like home ownership opportunities are very expensive to subsidize and we're not, you know, we're not building neighborhoods the way we used to. So it, it is, it's a, I think it's a, I do think it's a really interesting topic. I think it's really complex and challenging to resolve, but. Well, it's just like the homeless issue. You need a full court press, systemic wide approach. You need the, um, um, you know, uh, city ordinances that temp that uh, Philly used for Temple. Um, you know, uh, this is one reason the trust was formed. It's almost the total reason that uh, Amherst Community Land Trust was formed. Uh, it, it needs a full court press, just just like uh, you know substance abuse. Uh, you can't tweak it in one little area. Um, and not to be beside the point, but Students need affordable housing as well. Okay, well, I think we've done as much as we can in discussion of future work housing trust priorities. So unless anybody has another comment, I want to move on to the other agenda items before we uh, get too close to nine o'clock. Okay, thank you all. Um, so now we're up to uh, item five, which we've really pretty much done. Uh, Nate gave us a report on the fact that there is or will be a consultant going out looking at uh, wetlands issues at East Street, and he's expecting us to be able to do that with respect to hazardous materials also. And the goal of that, assuming that the site is buildable after we get the results of those reports, would be to revise and publish a new RFP uh, for that site, hopefully within a month or two. I guess a month would be too quick, but maybe a couple of months. Yeah, uh, John, you'd wanted this to be done by the end of the year and it may or may not be possible. Um, but I think, you know, the, when, um, at the last go around with an RFP, you know, the wetlands were an issue, the building, you know, materials, but it's also, you know, the question of does the town want to keep the building? So, you know, is, it's historic. You know, there were some questions about, you know, how much of a barrier is it to use the building or to demolish it? And I think the, um, you know, Valley, when they submitted their proposal, they said there were a lot of unanswered questions about the property and not that we would have those answers, but, you know, for instance, the trust could submit a demolition application perhaps and try to get the town to make a decision on that building before the RFP so that we have more things, um, you know, answered when we put it out there. Not that it's solved, you know, for instance, if, if we apply for a demolition permit and it gets a year delay, at least, you know, there's a year delay on it. You know, that's already been answered as opposed to when a developer takes control a year later, then they apply and then it's a year delay. And all of a sudden, instead of being a year, it's really like a two and a half year delay. So, you know, I think the E Street School site do, does have a few, a few things that need to be um, determined before we put out an RFP. Again, like how much flexibility do we have there? Do we have, we had a minimum number of units and a target number, you know, are we, do we, do those change? Does that change, you know, who would build there? If we say we'd like 15 affordable, but we don't want any more than 30, then we've kind of already hemmed in the project. Would we say we want a minimum of 15 affordable and we don't care how many there are, you know, does that, would it, would it, you know, you leave it up to the developer to say what's compatible with the neighborhood. I, I mean, I'm just, you know, there's all these little pieces that we had in the RFP that may have made it, um, you know, less desirable for a developer to respond to. Cause we, we have, it was pretty prescriptive. I, I, I actually said it would be nice to be prescriptive. Maybe we were 
too prescriptive with not enough information about the site in terms of the building, the wetlands, the priority for what we want to see. So I just, I would hate John to do a lot of the work and then go back out and not have, you know, have maybe one response again. I mean, maybe that's all we get is one response, but. Well, Nate, certainly we got to make sure that we um, uh, do a really good job of uh, getting the proposal out there. And, and I would strongly recommend uh, going out and polling developers to make sure you're getting out a proposal that is um, it's going to be attractive to them. And, right. Uh, and, and making sure you got a good, good list of people to send it to. It's, this is not a paving project. You know, this is not something you just put out on the state website right. and expect people to respond. You know, this, there's, there's a very select group of people who are going to do a project like this. Right. And then one, you know, there was a number of people asked, you know, how do the neighbors feel, you know, kind of asking about potential opposition and did we engage the na direct uh, neighbors and we, ha we, the town hadn't, you know, we had held meetings, but we hadn't say directly contacted neighbors. So, you know, I, you know, perhaps all these steps could be done in advance of the RFP just so you know, all those things can be addressed when there are questions or, you know. Yeah, we could do a request for information prior to an RFP. Uh, basically, I think that would satisfy what Tom was suggesting, that if we have what is essentially a draft, draft RFP and we ask developers to respond to it with questions and concerns, through an RFI or request for information process that might uh, put us in a better position to do the final RFP. And it wouldn't even have to be a formal process like that, John. You could just identify the, you know, three or four or five possibly, I mean, I think there's probably not that many likely uh, bidders and, you know, talk to them and say, what, what would you like to see? What, how would this work for you? Mm -hmm you know, just to get a little bit of feedback. So, so you're not surprised when nobody responds. Right. Okay. Oh, thanks, Tom. Yeah, I, yeah I, I just wrote down about six points that we could clear, try to address before we put out the RFP. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the second bullet under five we've already addressed. I will uh, send a memo to the town manager uh, regarding the Strong Street Park property and asking to move ahead with an evaluation related to uh, either affordable housing alone or affordable housing as part of a mixed development. Okay, I had a couple of updates. Uh, the ZBA is reviewing Amherst Studio Apartments tonight. Uh, the one focus was on uh, 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 local preference. Um, there were a variety of other things that uh, the Valley people were asked to address by the chair or by one of the members of the ZBA. Uh, basically, the one thing I wanted to say is that the last meeting, and you can listen to this uh, because all of the meetings have been recorded and they're now available online. Uh, I thought was really highlighted by some great testimony. There were 15 or 16 people who testified in favor of the project. I think only one or two who uh, testified negatively. Uh, that included Carol and Tom from this group. I can't remember, I'm, I'm leaving somebody else out. Uh, in any event, uh, the testimony was terrific. Uh, it was really very, strongly focused on what the need is and the importance of this project to Amherst and to the people it would serve. Uh, and you can hear that if you go to the, uh, to the link. Um, it happens, I can't remember, but it's, uh, well, somewhere deep into the meeting. Uh, but it was great and I think there, maybe partly as a consequence of that, I sense fewer and fewer questions from uh, either the chair who's made, had most of the questions or uh, from any of the members. The chair personally pronounced himself as satisfied 
with the social support plan for the project, said he'd learned enough and didn't think that there was need for more attention to that. So overall, I think the process has gone really well. And I, uh, although they're obviously not here to listen, I think Laura Baker and the other people at Valley have done a terrific job in presenting this. Um, and uh, I, I, I can't see how they don't approve it. Although I suppose I could say famous last words, knock on wood or whatever having said that. But I think the process is going well. Um, as Nate said, there probably be two or three more meetings before they reach a final conclusion about what they recommend. And particularly, not only do they recommend approval, but what caveats or what conditions do they place on it. Um, but I think things are going well. And I didn't necessarily think that two months ago. So this is good. Anybody else with comments on uh, the ZBA review? I will say that I think it will be continued um, until September 24th, so two weeks from today, and then and then October 8th is what they had outlined as two dates. So I was at the meeting earlier tonight. It did seem like it was going pretty well. Um, I had it on the whole time here, not not really listening, but. Seemed like Valley was able to get through quite a bit. They did their pro forma, which there were some questions. They did tenant selection, um, a number of things. So I think that I, I, you know, I think they are moving along. The next meeting on the twenty fourth, I think, is going to talk about architecture and um, density and and that type of um, aspect of the project. But you know, the staff and the ZBA chair, you know, outlined a process, and they would like to finish it next month. So. I felt, I, yeah, I thought, I thank everyone for their comments at the last meeting. I think they were really positive and made really good points. So it was nice to, it was nice to hear that. I think they're really eloquent and well-spoken. So it was points that, you know, the ZBA just, I think it was good to hear again. So I, I thanks everyone for speaking. I, that was, I thought it was really helpful. Do you think the chair will be inviting public comments at any, either of the next two meetings, the 24th or October 8th? Yeah, I think, Steve usually likes to, the, the chair likes to have public comment. Um, they were doing it when I signed off and he, I don't think he was going to, but they had some time. So he always likes to have public comment at every meeting. It may not come until 8.45 to nine o'clock, but he usually tries to have the public comment. Um, so I think he, he, I think he, you know, he does every meeting. Well, should we consider rescheduling our meeting for October 8th to a week later? Well, they're also gonna continue it to October 15th. So they have the 24, I was looking at, I just pulled up an email, it was the 24th, the 8th, and the 15th. So the, I think they're hoping they would be done on the 15th. So I don't see any dates after that. But. Okay, so I know Erica didn't have an opportunity earlier to comment and she wanted an opportunity. I didn't think it would come tonight. Right. Uh, based on what the chair had said earlier. Right, no, I, yeah, I didn't think it was going to either, but. Okay, so I guess we'll keep our next meeting for the 8th and hope for the best. And uh, there probably will be an opportunity for public comment then on <coughs> Thursday night, September 24th. Yeah, I guess maybe if, if the 24th doesn't have public comment, maybe we switch from the 8th to the 15th. Because the 8th, I think they'll definitely have public comment because that's when they would be discussing maybe possible conditions or other things. So it may be good to have voices heard then. I, I don't, I don't really know, but let's, we could say, I mean, I, I kind of want to say, let's just do, when would we normally meet, John? The second Tuesday, a uh, second Thursday of the month. Which ends up being? The 8th, I believe. Yeah. Could we just do the 15th though, just to be safe, just so the 8th is available for trust members to attend the, the he hearing? I mean, I guess it's up to the trust members, what you think. Right. Yeah, I like to do this in advance so people are aware right. of any change. Does anybody have a preference for sticking with the 8th versus going to the 15th? Okay, so should we switch to the 15th? Looks like it. I don't think we need to take a formal vote. Uh, yeah. 
gosh, I can't believe it's in October already. Will be. Yeah. Okay, so it'll be the 15th then. And I or Nate or both of us will send out announcements to that effect. Uh, there are a couple of uh, other things I just wanted to update you on. Uh, there are two groups that I'm attending or have been attending, the Community Resource Committee and the Energy and Climate Action Building Committee. The first one I am obviously not a member of, and I thought I had an agreement where if I submitted goals for a comprehensive town housing policy as a set of ideas, it might receive some discussion. Uh, basically, I found I was ignored and felt actually disinvited, not only at that meeting, but any future meeting. So I'm not sure I'll be uh, attending the Community Resource Committee until they are open to outside input. Essentially, the message I was getting was, uh, well, the committee has to work within its own membership before they really want to receive any public input. Uh, so uh, uh, if anybody else wants to take a shot at that, that's fine. <laughs> Uh, the other group I participating in, I, I mentioned, um, they've had a couple of meetings. Um, I had a couple of notes. Uh, uh, basically, um, it, that's also going to be a long process. Uh, they're asking questions about on the one hand, how do we enhance the quality of life in part through the building process, but also how do we reduce carbon emissions? And there was a general recognition, I think, by the people who set this up that they were proposing a daunting task, but hopefully there will be a value in taking it on to combat uh, climate change. So that's moving along. Um, you know, there was an open discussion at the, one of the meetings about what it takes to make a better building. Um, there was some discussion of what's meant by affordability. People were concerned that it mean not just rent, but other costs that get in as well. And uh, there was also a lot of discussion about uh, problems faced by individual renters in Amherst. I don't know if this is the place where those problems can be addressed, but the committee particularly is open to hearing from people who are renters in Amherst. Uh, and I think that's a good thing, um, but it will take time to move along. So that's a kind of a quick report. I'm sorry if it's a little vague, Honestly, the process is a little vague, but uh, I think it's a good group of people. And uh, they also have outside consultants who are working with everything. So the last thing I had was the listing of upcoming events. I did mention the Community Resource Committee will on October 6th at the afternoon uh, be taking their next stab at discussion of what goals should be for town, general town housing policy. Um, the next ZBA hearing we now know is on the 24th with uh, meetings, hearings to follow on the 8th of October and the 15th. Uh, the housing coalition, which has been dormant to some extent, although a number of people from the housing coalition did testify uh, before the ZBA, which was great, We'll be meeting again via Zoom on September 22nd. You all receive those notices. And finally, um, the next meeting of the Housing Trust will now be on October 15th, not the 8th. OK, any additional questions or comments? Well, thank you all for participating. Um, this was a good meeting, if a little difficult at times struggling with what our priorities should be and what we should try to move forward with. Um, any, I guess I just asked if there are any more comments. There don't appear to be. So are we ready to adjourn? 
Okay, most everybody's muted, so I will look, see the head nods and figure everybody's ready. So we are two minutes past nine, not too bad. Again, I appreciate everybody's participation. Thanks very much. And I'll look forward to seeing you in October, if not before. Good night, Thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye, everyone. Thank you, John. Good night.